to the cloud. Here we go. Okay, uh, let's let them in. Let my people in. Hello, good afternoon and good morning and good night in the UK. Evening, perhaps. Hi, everyone. Come on into the Zoom. It's like any other Zoom, except not. Hey, Micah, great to see you. Nicole is with us again. What is up, Sarah? We got some pretty looking panels in there. Hello to Jeffrey. Hi, Tim. I love seeing everybody's mics and studios. What is up, Sheila? Thanks for coming. I'm letting the people into the space. Hello. Look, look, look at Barbara Farragher's hair. That's lovely. <laughs> look, it's just <laughs> a great headshot. Oh my God, we do love a good headshot here. <laughs> it's a hair shot. That is it's tremendous. <laughs> yes, hello, Dina. Good morning. Yep, I shouted at her. She, she's fine with it. She's, she's got good headphones though, so that was loud. Yeah, that was loud. <laughs> Sorry, I um, in all my time alone, I forget uh, how to greet people. Hello, John, great to see you. Daniel, Daniel's got like a step and repeat in there. Hello, hi, Joyce. <laughs> yes, okay, wait, Daniel's with us from far away. This is wonderful. Hi, everyone. Great to see you once again. Hello, hello. I love this moist Manhattan. Wow, what a statement that is. My name is Siobhan. I'm so happy to see you all. This is our uh, Edge Studio Ask Me Anything session. Um, I am the social media manager and community relations human being here at Edge Studio. And uh, this is our Boy, we've done almost 30 of these sessions since the pandemic began, and we are happy to do it again. Uh, I, I wanna check in with uh, our Chief Edge Officer, David Goldberg. He's to my Zoom right, and I don't know where he is in your square. Hi, David, how are you? Good, hello. Great to Yvonne, see you. Yvonne, I was wondering, I think, is this 27 this week? I think it's, tw I think it is 27, yes. Wow. It's a beautiful number. What those are nice numbers, you know, two and seven. We really uh, like the shape of those numbers. And you know, uh, David, are you well today? How are you? I feel well. Ask me next week after my second shot, and then okay. I'll let you know. <laughs> shots, shots, shots. Yes. All right. <laughs> Woo! I really just want that party vibe. I'm trying to make it happen, and it's tough. Speaking of shots, shots, shots. Uh, someone is here, fresh off of their second Moderna shot and uh, a dear friend of mine and also my uh, former coach and our guest star today. We've got Johnny Heller. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming aboard. Yeah, I, I just had my second shot on Tuesday and uh, Tuesday and Wednesday were just just wretched. And today I'm okay again, but it was really uh, <laughs> not, not great, but uh, better better than the alternative, I expect. I, I do want to say one quick thing. I'm in my living room right now, and I do I do live in Manhattan, and I do have dogs, but I'm revamping my studio, so I'm out here. But you may hear both uh, uh, sirens and people and, and doggies, just letting you know. Yeah, you know, the people of the cities, I think we can, uh, I think we can relate. Also, we do love a studio revamp. That's very exciting. I know last time we were talking about bouquets of microphones, and uh, Johnny, can, what are you doing to your studio? Do you, can you tell us? Yeah, well, we got an AT4047. Um, we had had, um, Joanne and I both recorded in the studio and we had actually producers give us microphones. And I don't, I don't, I'm as James Rumman, because I'm not a tech guy. I don't, I don't need to speak into the thing and uh, <laughs> it hopefully picks you up. I don't pay attention to anything. I had uh, uh, some engineers come to my place, set it all up and I haven't touched it and like, eight years, I haven't touched a thing. Um, so now, uh, I, I use Studio One now because I, I just didn't like Pro Tools, but we just got the newest version of Pro Tools, we upgraded, we're taking down all, we had all this foam, acoustic foam, and, and it, it not only does it look like you live in, uh, like you're an egg in a crate, but it's it just, I think there's a lot of dust and particles. Uh, so we're switching, I had someone design and send me uh, acoustic paneling. So I'll be taking the foam out, cleaning the whole booth of every possible bit of dust or anything in there, and then popping the acoustic paneling in. And I expect it's going to take, there's a little, um, it's great for audiobooks, but not perfect necessarily for commercial and other work. Um, it's a little boxy sounding now, and I'm getting some, um, some baffles. How about that, James Romick? I use the word baffle. I'm going to get them and set it in there. So I'm going to uh, 
So it's gonna, it's gonna, I, I think it's gonna improve the quality of the sound. It won't do a thing for my acting, however. You, you know, uh, what, what can be done about your acting though, John? <laughs> this is it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I peaked, I peaked in high school. <laughs> um, everyone, if you don't know Johnny Heller, he is an, an award-winning, a multi-award-winning audiobook narrator and a self-proclaimed not-tech guy. So for my not-tech people who are into VO, learning about VO and intimidated, Johnny is often my example of how you will be okay, you can be okay, you can even revamp your studio and sort of talk about it. Uh, you, so, um, you know, just look to Johnny. What a role model, as we all uh, have already witnessed. Um, yes. Thank you all for being here. Um, there's so many uh, awesome people just filing on in. Here we are at 95. Um, boy, I wish we were at like a party situation right now, but that is okay. Um, so the way our sessions work, if you've never been with us before, thank you for coming. Um, we're just gonna hang out and talk VO. We're gonna utilize the wonderful talents and generosity of Johnny for spending time with us for this hour. And the way we're gonna do it is by you just dropping your questions in the chat and I will send them to Johnny. I will try to get to everybody. If I don't get to you, it is not that I don't love you. I'm just you know, doing my best here. You are on mute. That is because I want to avoid Zoom chaos. And uh, unfortunately, that's just the deal. You know, you can pin Johnny, you can pin me. I like to keep it in gallery mode because I like to feel like we're all together and I love to see your spaces. James has got a great uh, portrait filter happening here with the blurred background. Barry's place is one of my favorite uh, Zoom home situations because of all of his natural lighting. So, uh, and you know, Micah's <laughs> studio is great. It's just great to see y'all once again. And uh, Johnny, they're saying that you now have x-ray vision because of your second Moderna. Um, maybe that's true, you know? Some of us wouldn't know at this point. Um, okay. uh, doesn't, doesn't appear to be the case. No. <laughs> doesn't appear. <laughs> well, all right. Sorry, everyone. Big disappointment. Um, <laughs> Think if I feel about it. Yeah. With, with x ray vision, you could actually see the conclusion of your book before you're even up to the, uh, the end, right? You know, you could be yeah, on chapter yeah, one and know what yeah. happens. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't, yes. have, you wouldn't have to like see, review see, the book before narrating it. Hey, prep time. Yeah. Just ruin stories forever. So um, what, I, uh, what I like to start with when we have a guest star is for those of you who don't know um, our, our coaches is if, uh, if Johnny can just give us a little bit of a uh, story of, of his journey in VO and how he ended up here. <laughs> we were talking about credit card debt uh, just before you all came in. <laughs> so um, Johnny, if you can tell us a little bit about uh, your, yeah, your experience um, in the performing world and how you became a, a, an, an award-winning. Uh, when, when I left uh, college way back when, uh, I was a political science American history major and I, I wrote a comedy, uh, comedy pages for the school newspaper and I got a job for the Chicago Sun-Times and the Chicago Tribune as a reporter. And then I left it all behind, become a world famous actor. <laughs> so see how well that went. So that I, um, so what I did, actually I was studying Shakespeare and I expected to be Puck for about 50 years. And then what happened was um, I had a, what they call a quirky voice. And still, I, I love this story because it's, it just shows you everything you need to know about the commercial world. This is before I knew about audiobooks. There weren't, I don't think there were audiobooks, but this was uh, uh, way back when. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Campbell Soup was looking for a, uh, a guy to do a commercial and they went in those days you didn't have internet even so they traveled so they'd have the Campbell soup uh advertising people and all the people and they traveled to New York and California and Chicago and I think they're just drinking junkets so by the time they got to Chicago they looked at me and about 50 other people and this literally was the audition and the line and the job I did this mm -mm. so of course I got hired because I'm awesome at that and uh, um that and 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 I made a just a boatload of money, and I'm thinking, what what am I looking at Puck for? So um, I start so I a commercial agent signed me, and I started doing commercial stuff, and I did pretty well, and I started doing on camera stuff, and then um, I went to L.A. for a while and did some uh, um, a lot of cartoons, voices, and some on camera uh, um, guest star things and pilots and stuff, uh, and then came back to New York. Um, to be honest, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on. I was doing the Rodney King riots and stuff. So I was like, get out of here. So I'm back to good old safe Manhattan. And uh, um, 
And then, and then I got into uh, audio books almost by accident. You can't even get into the industry the way I got in. And that became where I, my home. And I didn't know until I was in it for X number of years that, that uh, there were other publishers doing. I worked for one publisher for the first six, seven years. I didn't know there were other people. So, that, so now I've done about a thousand audio books. Uh, I'm a Grammy nominee now. I'm a, what they call a Golden Voice Award winner, um, which kind of, which is kind, that's kind of cool. Actually, I'm proud of that. Um, the Grammy is swell, but I, you know, that's because I was in a book that Meryl Streep was a star in. So it wasn't because of anything I had to do with it, but it was just a nice little bonus they threw you away. And I got awards, which are you know swell because otherwise you'd have empty shells. But uh, um, for me, and if you're a coach of me, you'll know that. As far as I'm concerned, this job, audiobooks and voiceovers in general, isn't about the awards, isn't about any, it's about continuing to work in the industry. The surest sign of success is a second job from the same client, as far as I'm concerned. Everything else is gravy or not, but you want to continue to work, that's all. And that's a short, very short, well, I forgot, I did stand-up comedy for a long time too. A lot, like years, I traveled around as a stand-up comic. And then I gave that up because stand-up comics are not good natured, decent human beings. <laughs> wretched, wretched souls. And probably even lower paid than actors, maybe. I don't know. Oh, no, you, you can, no, you start doing, you start opening or doing middles or close uh, the, 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 no, you can make some decent loot. At least when I was on the road, you could for those days. Yeah. I don't know what you do now. And, and also you could get, you know, you, you can get a sitcom on, on the CW network for a week. For, for a whole week. Yeah. Um, I forgot about, or maybe I didn't even know that you had been doing stand up for a while. Um, good thing you uh, went to, you know, voiceover, considering how funny you are, Johnny. So, um, hey, Johnny actually makes me laugh a whole lot. So now you do sit down comedy. Thanks, Brian. You guys are great. Um, okay, so let's get into uh, questions then. Um, we're just, I'm just going to go through the chat and where we're at. And yeah, here we are at over almost 110 people. Love this. All right. So um, from Al, uh, this is interesting. Johnny, what do you think are the most important trends affecting your specialty um, in the VO business uh, that <laughs> people could be mindful of at this point? I don't know if that, I don't know, I'm not sure how to answer the trends in the industry. I think that well the biggest well, the biggest trend in the last five, 10 years is uh, the home studios, at least in audiobooks. The reason that's such a booming business is because people publishers and and publishers don't have to uh, don't have to hire studios. Everybody does it from their own home studio. and that's why so many of you are so great at putting together uh, wonderful home studios with a great sound. Again, that doesn't make you know having a great studio and a great all, you know, well, you have, if you have a credit card, you can buy all the equipment you need. And then if you have any knowledge, you can put it all together, but you still have to be able to perform. But having that home studio seems to be um, not optional anymore. Um, in a lot of actors, in a lot of commercials, I'm a union actor. So a lot, I'm not FICOR, I'm union. So a lot of the, and nothing against FICOR, I don't mean to say that. But I am saying that I can't do a lot of the spots that are sent my way, commercial spots, are non-union spots. And I can't touch them, but the audiobook world, that's pretty much all union, so I can touch that. And uh, I get a lot of work because I have a good studio. I mean, because I'm decent, but also I have a home studio. If I didn't have a home studio, I would not have a thousand books. So, Johnny, before the pandemic, how often were you recording audiobooks in, prof in professional studios that were not your own? Pandemics, so that's about like 10 pounds ago for me. Um, let's see, I was, uh, uh, how, many, how many times was I in a studio, you mean? Yeah, like, you know, you used to go to Random House, right? And yeah, like, random, yeah, 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 you go there. You know, I actually love, I much prefer going to the studio. Sure. Like, much prefer. First off, you, feel, you just feel great. They treat you like a king. They have great coffee machines. Uh, sometimes they buy you lunch. It's, it's kind of neat. And, and it's just cool. And also, you have nothing to do except the book. One of the problems with the home studio is that you live there and all your stuff is there. And so there's all these things preying on your time. But I would say I went to, it really depended on the schedule. A lot of times public, because I'm known, they trust me to do it in my home studio. I think a lot of the books I did, if I was new, they would have had me with the director in, a, in their studio, which is great. But I probably went, I don't know, not more than 10 times, 10 times in a year. 
Okay. Okay. So you, so you were still like 80% recording from your home. Oh, 80, 80, 90% from my house. Yeah. Okay. And again, the numbers could be changed, but yeah. So that's really important for everybody who's interested in audiobooks and just exploring this to know that you be recording your book. <laughs> I mean, and so, uh, which feels overwhelming as a concept to me, but Johnny, you're used to it. You're, it's just what you do. Let me, you know, actually going back to the trend, one of the other big trends, and this is important in every bit of the voice of the world, is being able to self-direct. And that covers a ton, and, and David's quite wonderful at helping people with this too. Um, Self-direction, the, uh, the ability to, to recognize gaffes of your own, to realize you're not in the moment, to be disconnected, particularly in the audiobook world, which is long-term narration, long form, long, long, long form. <laughs> so a 10-hour book, you're not doing it in a 10-hour stretch, but there are times you are going to be disconnected and you have to recognize you did, because anytime the actor is disconnected, from the, the moment that the author wrote, disconnected from the copy, whether it's commercial or video games, anything. If you're disconnected, the listener senses it. They may not know what it is, but it's like watching a play and someone goes up on the lines and you know it. You know, the really good actors cover, but, uh, uh, but, but you have that self-direction and that, that's a talent that has to be developed, has to Johnny, be. Johnny, what might be interesting for everyone to hear is what percentage of audiobooks uh, you record from home where a director is on the phone with you or through Skype and, and they're directing you remotely? Um, that's happened. Thank you. Ooh, coffee. That's happened. Um, well, more during the COVID time. Penguin Random House tends to do that. All, they almost always assign a director. That's just the nature of their business. Every once in a while they give me books, I just do it. But frequently there's a director on, on the phone. I'd say I've only done three or four though. Most of my stuff is just me. Um, we just did, actually, I'm really proud of this. We just did Macbeth, uh, the Scottish play. Um, uh, Paul Rubin directed, and he was on, and he went with uh, Scott Brick and Kata Mazur and uh, Carol Wanda. Um, just, just a top flight cast, and I'm really proud of it. And we were directed there. And it's so weird. It's so, when you hear it, I know editing is a big part, but it sounds like we're all in the same place. And it's just, it's even though I was a part of it, I have to say it's one of the, my favorite productions of Macbeth ever is it just works. And that has ever a lot to do with the fact there was a director. I don't think it would have been half as good if, if we had all, if we had to just do our parts and someone else clapped it all together. Having a director is really, really wonderful. And it's just too infrequent now. One of the issues in voiceover in, in voiceover in general, audiobooks in specific is there's an expectation that the talent can self-direct. And it's not always a skill people have. I don't know if just people who have their cameras on, if you've ever listened to an audiobook that was narrated by the writer and it was actually very boring. Like, has anybody had that experience where you're like, oh, this is so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, cause they're not self-directing really. They're, they're, they wrote the book, you know, these are so many, there's so many different skills. Um, so, okay, so I think this is important. And David, do you want to add anything on to this kind of home studio? self-editing or self-directing. I know David teaches a course on self-direction. So um, I don't know if there's anything you wanna to add to this, to this theme before we move well, on. Yeah, just sort of a funny comment um, and aside. So it is pretty common for authors to want to narrate their own books. And yeah, like you said, Javon, they're not trained. They're not trained as voice actors. And what I don't, what I've never understood is why authors think that it's okay for them to narrate their own audiobook, But if there's a movie made of the book, they would never think, they would not even think for a moment about being the star in, in the movie. I don't know why they think that it's okay to uh, voice act, um, but not just, you know, legit act or film act. It's uh, an odd thing. I think so, yeah, we do work with that. What, 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 Johnny? Many of them aren't attractive. So they decided to have someone else <laughs> play them who are better looking than them. Yeah, well, we've <laughs> certainly had a lot of CEOs and, and authors try to narrate books and, oh my goodness, it's, it's tough. It's really, it's tough for our team just to stay focused when listening to someone read in such a monotone way um, and really hard to get them to pull out some performance when they just, they're not trained at all. We've had, over the years, we've had a, a number of, of uh, authors and, and CEOs say, you know what, okay, give me some training first. And, and it's been helpful. But, yes, uh, anyway. sometimes I listen to a podcast and I'm like, wow, if they had one session where they learned how to have some breath support, this podcast yeah. might be so much 
better. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the content can be great. It just, but the delivery is so key. So key. And it's why I struggle with podcasts because being in voiceover has made me a snob. So, um, <laughs> uh, so this is from Alexis. Hey, Alexis, how are you? Um, asking, uh, my question about continuing education is how often do you, oh, and this is great for Johnny because I know um, Johnny does this, but how often do you take classes and coaching for your performance? After a certain amount of time, when you want to work in a new genre, do you put a certain percentage of your income toward training? Um, yeah, let's start with Johnny there. I think like genres I'm not super familiar with, like um, Tom Deere does a lot with uh, e-learning and uh, uh, other narration that I'm not too familiar with. So I have some, um, actually I was about to start some stuff with him when COVID came and I decided, and I, I'll be honest, well, I've done a bunch of virtual workshops, taught a bunch. I, I like, I want to see the person. I just like to be there. Um, I, I kind of, I, I hunger for that. So I'm going to, now that um, I'm vaxxed and I think Tommy's vaxxed, we're going to get together and do this. Um, I think you need, it's a requirement, I think, to at least take some courses to get some kind of background. The assumption that because you can do one thing, you can do another. It's like if you're a good actor, you're not necessarily a great singer or a great dancer. It's not automatic. And the thought that I can do anything, which is, you know, wonderful, positive, you know, positive and stuff, you know, is, is BS. You can't do anything. I cannot dunk a basketball on a regulation court. I'm just not going to get there without, without a ladder or, or a push-up. So, and I know that. So, I, and I think you need to know, one of the things actors need to know is their actual limitations and their, um, their fears. And there's a difference. But I think, like I, co I study with, a, um, I've studied with a, a number of people in a number of things. Also, when I have workshops with a, I have a bunch of different coaches, some of my own things, and I, um, whenever I work with other other coaches at Edge or anything like that, I learn from them. And even while I teach, I learn. I learn from my students regularly. Some of the things they ask, some of the things they say, I'm like, I've never encountered this. But the questions are, you can, you should always, always as an actor, particularly, you need always to be learning. You, uh, you always need to be in. Uh, in the learning mode. And that's why I think there's, you can't, you literally can't have too much learning. Mm. Mm. Yeah, David, do you want anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I think of every, well, I agree with everything Johnny said. And I think one of the, the most important things there is to know your limitations, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. And yeah, it's, it's great to be well-rounded and have some some general comprehension of all of the genres. So if a, a client asks you to do something, you can say, well, you know, I, it's not my, my focus, but I'm happy to give it a shot. Um, but also trusting your voice and trusting your, your natural ability and focusing in some genres is really, I think, very helpful because, yeah, you can't be everything to everyone. You shouldn't want to be everything to everyone. It's, our industry is way too big to do that. And sometimes I've seen clients shy away from voice actors because the voice actor claims on their website, for example, that they can offer every conceivable style of, of voiceover. And that's like a jack of all trades. And that can, can turn some clients off. So yeah, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. I directed a documentary earlier this morning. And the guy that I worked with, he has a terrific voice. I don't think he can do anything else other than one certain type of documentary narration. That's what he's key for. Uh, his voice is just, he's fabulous for it. But he can't go outside of that one genre, really. And he knows it. And uh, But he was trying to, you know, he wants to expand. Uh, and he's talked about it for years. Um, but, you know, again, he knows his strengths. He knows his weaknesses. And also, he knows what he's being hired for. That's a key thing, everyone. When you hit the industry, you'll start to find out from your clients. You will learn from your clients where your strengths are, what, the, what types of scripts they hire you for. And that's interesting also. But, yeah, learning should never end. It's making me think about, too, um, something that uh, Kevin, uh, our lead engineer, said after one of our in-person mixers a very long time ago, it feels, where he said, you know, I love these events because you have seasoned veteran voice actors hanging out with young newbies who've never been in the booth before, and they're exchanging cards, and the seasoned folks are like, oh, you're doing Instagram and TikTok, like, I need help with that, right? And people are talking to each other, and going with the intention always to learn and that you can learn in unexpected ways. And um, 
that, that having that presence of mind is important. And then Alexis, to that, um, to that effort, there are, of course, ooh, I'm gonna plug it, drop a link right now. We have a virtual mixer coming up at the end of the month. It is free. Uh, it's gonna be wet. I'm, I'm running it, y'all. It's my show. Come to it. It's free. <coughs> we got breakout rooms, and it's gonna be wild. And uh, it's gonna be like evening time. So get. I'm gonna get my evening vibe on, and I hope <laughs> that you all can come. Uh, but um, you know, so there's things you can do uh, for that are resources that are free that are available. But I certainly think, and I think Johnny and David would attest to this as well. You know, uh, Johnny, when you work with Tom Deere, you're you're a client of his, correct? Like. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. He charges me, or or at least lunch. Yeah. Right, right. So that's an investment that Johnny's continuing to make, even when he's a Golden Voice winner. So, uh, I yeah. So I think that's important to always be a, a student for a performance as well as everything else in this industry. Um. So so speaking of performance elements, uh, Noah is asking. Johnny, uh, do you have basic breathing techniques for your audiobook narration? How the hell do you, sorry, oh, forgive me, everyone. How the heck do you <laughs> get through? Oh, yeah, don't swear. <laughs> Audio books are hard. How do you get through it? How do you keep on top of your breath through an entire uh, Okay, let, let's, let's, let's talk about breathing for a second. There are, um, I don't know how to do it. Okay, a lot of people, if, Here's the deal, people, a lot of people edit out breaths. Uh, they take time in the studio, to edit out breaths. Here's the thing, human beings breathe. It's not unusual to take a breath anytime during the day, sometimes five or six times in a given day, you might breathe. If you're doing a book, it's okay to breathe. What's not okay is to wheeze like an asthmatic. So it was the best of times, was the worst of times. <laughs> That's not gonna work, okay? Don't do that. But if you want to say it's the best of times was the worst of times. And then you go on. See, I took a breath. You didn't even hear it. It's absolutely natural. To take breaths out is unnatural. You need to know what your ability is in terms of breath groups. By breath groups, it's an acting term. I mean, how, it comes mostly from Shakespeare. How long can you get through or should you get through before you take a breath? If this speech needs to have all these points realized on one breath, you have to build to the point where you can do that. However, if you can't get the sentence or phrase out in a given breath group, you need to find ways to cheat. You can cheat on punctuation marks, on, uh, on uh, indefinite articles like the, prepositional phrases that begin with of or something. You can suck a little, take a little breath. Usually there's a natural pause in the structure of a sentence allowing you, you have to be something of a grammarian to be a decent audiobook guy. You have to understand where a potential breath group, a new breath can be taken. And sometimes you only need, if you, and then you go, and then you go, and then you go, and then you go, a little tiny breath in there. But if you hear, that's not horrific. So in terms of a length of an audiobook, if a natural audiobook, let's say, let's say it's 10 hours, in uh, the average would be, it's two to one for the actor. A 10 hour book takes 20 hours. If it's James Joyce, we're not talking that at all. We're talking like 365 days to get a paragraph. But in regular books, it's 10 hours, is you're in the booth 20 hours. But you're not in the booth 20 hours straight. Most people work three to four hours in a given day, whatever. The trick is this, when you schedule time in your home booth, schedule the time, stay in there. I mean, use that time, don't stay in there. You gotta get up and get out. Even in the three, four hours, get up and get out every once in a while. You need to get up and move because it's unnatural to read, stay connected for three or four straight hours. It's unnatural. You got to take breaks. But if you're going to work three, if you schedule um, 11 to three is your work time, make that your work time. Don't, don't be distracted. Don't go on social media. Don't go on Facebook. Don't go on those things. Unless you want to say, I'm going to work 45 minutes and I'm going to step out, sit outside, um, uh, is smoke, smoke my, my pipe filled with whatever in Manhattan. You can certainly fill with weed now. Um, uh, and then, and then, and then I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, go on Facebook. And then I can go back to my booth and get back into it. Cause sometimes you need that break, but you're not working that you're not doing 20 hours straight. That 10 hours that you did that the total book is, is broken up in X number of days. 
And the audiobook also requires prep to, to understand what's coming, to read the audiobook, to get ready. And we're not even talking about the editing after you're done recording. But in terms of your workflow and your time and your breath and everything, just breathe like a human being. I'll bet you people who bring up breath questions have never been stopped in the middle of a conversation with someone they know and love and said, boy, you breathe loud. It's never happened. Relax. Yeah, it's so Go ahead. I was going to say that same thing, Johnny. Um, I found over the years that most newcomers to voiceover, they focus so much on breathing that it actually throws their breathing off, right? They, they hyper-focus on it, and therefore, they try to hide breaths when they really should be breathing. And when they do breathe, it, down, it does sound too loud. And in most cases, everyone, don't even think about it. In most cases, just talk naturally. Um, something Johnny said was that as human beings, we do naturally breathe five or six times, probably five or six million times a day. <laughs> and the, the listeners are also used to hearing speakers breathe. It sounds actually unnatural if all the breaths are removed. So typically in audiobooks, the breaths are left. Um, if a voice actor is, is very loud on their breaths, we may uh, lower the volume of the breaths. But again, if you don't think about it, in most cases, you'll be fine. Just don't even think about it, okay, guys? It really will make it much easier. And when you do need to take a breath, for example, in a run-on sentence or something like that, don't try to make that breath so quick that it sounds like a gasp. Instead, just let it sound natural, intentional. And again, then your breath won't be overly loud. You'll save yourself loads of time editing and your book will sound more natural. Uh, one last thing just to point out. I believe that the, the human brain can absorb about five seconds of content at a time without needing a break. Okay, let me repeat that. So when listening to someone speak, that listener can't absorb more than about five seconds of words coming at them from someone else. And... Fortunately, a line of text in a book typically is about five seconds. So that means on average, you probably want to pause once every line of text. I'm not talking sentences or phrases, but a, a single line of text, regular typical point size and font size and, and everything. So if you have a run on sentence, a line of text or a sentence that is two or three lines long, yeah, take a breath at, you know, once every other, uh, once every line. But again, let it sound intentional. Don't overthink it. I, uh, I am one of those voice actors uh, who, move, you know, going from theater and stage performance where you memorize everything and your text is internalized, so I'm not looking at it and freaking out about it, uh, and, and it's easy to get into your head. So if you're one of those people, just it's like, that's okay, it's normal, but this kind of having direction, coaching, and training that helps you find some ease with your text and learning to just read it and not have to memorize everything, I think is a different skill. Um, and it's one that we that we need to foster and grow. Um, so- Can I make a quick point? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just one thing about, I, I started, uh, my training was off stage in theater. And one of the things that I had to discover fairly quickly outside of, when I began in audiobooks, is mostly in uh, little kids and you're know, very kid kids books because I'm sophomoric and hyper. So that's how I got the gig. Um, later on, now most of my stuff is, you know, the mature stuff because I'm, I'm immature. But um, one thing I discovered was, you know, the, uh, acting in the, the jazz hands and the big presentational theater things, which works when you're doing the music, man, doesn't work in a lot of voiceover, particularly not in audiobooks. I would compare audiobooks, for those of you who wish to get into it, much more as a film acting technique. Smaller, less, less. There are so many actors, and I'm just gonna, and then, I'll, then you do a question again. There's one thing that comes to me all the time. I'll meet someone, let's say David's gonna be my student. He comes in and we're talking, hi, David, hi, Johnny, how are you? We're talking, what's your background? We talk, just like this. And all of a sudden, all right, David, well, it's the best of times. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what the hell was that? All of a sudden, this big booming actor guy comes in who wasn't there five minutes ago. And that's the kind of thing that's really gonna make your performance um, A, not marketable, and B, really weird. People won't share an elevator with you if you do that. So what you want to do is just, just bring it down. Just take it down like this. Also, there's so many places to go from there, from here, that you can't go from here. And just in a general sense, bigger is not better. Less is more. Okay, so write that down. Okay, sorry, carry on. Oh, and, and that's because listening to voiceover is a solitary activity, right? You know, you listen to voiceover by yourself. And all of you can think about this. If you watch a documentary, you're probably by yourself. You listen to an audiobook or a podcast or commercial. 
you're probably by yourself. So as the voice actor, just remember you're talking to one person. Yeah, so don't blow them away. <laughs> um, from Tanya, um, so as we know, or maybe we don't know, but Johnny has told us before, you read the book before you record it. Like that's a general note. Um, and so Tanya is asking, when you read the book prior to narration, what is your method or process for remembering or documenting or outlining the characters, chapter nuances? Do you have a specific process? This is a fabulous question, Tanya. What's your experience of reading the book, Johnny? Um, I will tell you how it was in the beginning as opposed to how it is now, because obviously in time things change or become more instinctive um, as time goes on. In the beginning, <laughs> you take the book. What I would do is I, 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 re I read the book and the, the same way you're sitting home reading the book, I believe authors write in a way that creates images in the reader's or listener's mind. Therefore, there's a cinematic quality to the audiobook world. I'm creating scenes in your mind. That's why you read a book and you're lost because you're in that other world. Whether it's fiction or nonfiction, the author's created this place to be, this learning place or enjoying place or whatever. So the actor has to be aware of that. So when I read the book to prep it, I'm noting two things as I go. Well, three things. One, the story, so I know what happens. Yes, you have to read the book first because I can't tell you the story if I don't know it. You know, it's, it's fine, fine to surprise your listener. It's no good to be surprised yourself. You know, <laughs> you can't say, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. You need to know it's going to happen. Then the other thing is you need, to, you need to know what's happening in the book, what the story is. You need to know the words that you can't pronounce. So may I make a note of those? There are words you can, in fiction and nonfiction. If I don't know what it means, usually when you're reading a book and there's a word you don't know, you kind of zip through it and figure it out. You'll figure it out by context. And if it's the name of a place in France, who cares? Because you're still not going there in the next chapter is going to be in some other place. So you don't care. But the audiobook narrator has to care. And the third thing is the characters. I write down the characters. Um, uh, here's, here's Siobhan. I write down, and based on what she says, how she says it, how the author describes her, her attitude, what she's like in the context of the scene, who is she? What image do I have in my head? Frankly, how would I cast? If I could cast Siobhan, the character Siobhan, from all the people I know in my frame of reference, from the time I it was whelped to now, all, all the schooling, all the friends, all the films, all the TV, everything. Who is Siobhan? And I decide she's Reese Witherspoon. Okay, so Siobhan is Reese Witherspoon. That's who I've cast her. I don't want to do a Reese Witherspoon impersonation, but if I think that, I guarantee it'll be a different read for me than if I decided she was Kate Hepburn. I think the, the more specific you can be in deciding who the character is, or sometimes you can be a little broader you can say uh, so and so is a um, oh a snooty New England lawyer. That's the perception I have. Then, depending on the context of the book, it could be either any of the Kennedys or Mayor Quimby. It just depends. So, um, but so I try and write down. I try and cast. So I write down the characters and my initial feelings. I write down the words I don't know and I look them up so that when I say them, it sounds like I know what the I've done. I did a bunch of Doctor Oz books. I did. I've done so many books on human genome theory. I can't even count. I don't know what I'm talking about. I've done a million science books. Don't know a thing about what I'm talking about. The listener doesn't know I don't know what I'm talking about because I understand. I read up, I, I, I looked at the word, how to say them. So I can, so it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. I promise you, I could not tell you right now what a genome is. I've done at least eight books. I have no clue what I'm talking about. Just get through it. So, but I'm acting like I know what I'm talking about. That's something else you could think of. People say to me all the time, I don't know how to do that. And then, you know, Tony Robbins, the big, the big Tony Robbins, uh, um, the uh, self-actualizing guy, you know what I'm talking about, right? The giant with him. He's, he's, anyway, so he, he is, I, it's odd, but I do think one thing he says is great. It's irritating, but it's what a therapist says. <laughs> when, you, when your therapist, assuming you have one, says, and you say, how do you feel about it? Say, I don't know. And then the therapist goes, but what would you think if you did know? So you can't get out of it. So how would you behave if you did know? Because I don't know is never gonna suffice as an answer. It just isn't. So if you did know, how would you act? So that, those are the three things. And right now, because I've done it so long, 
Um, what I like to do, and this is, I, I know I'm, I would do this real quick character thing. In every recording software, uh, whether it's Reaper that James loves, Studio One, Pro Tools, everything, there, there is something called bookmarking where David Goldberg's the character. David comes up and I make David Goldberg talk like, that's what I want. This is my David Goldberg. That's not him, but let's say that's a guy. So I want to keep that voice. And let's say David showed up on page 13 and not again to page 322. Well, bookmarking allows me to say, oh, that's what I did for him. And if I find out later that, you know, geez, that's not a good voice, let me change it. Or sometimes you get a book with 50 to 150 characters. I, I use, because, because I'm, I'm a Luddite, I use my uh, uh, smartphone, which is a smart. And under, in this little thing here, it has a voice memo. I have got a character, you can't see it. Let's see, no, you can't see it. That's sorry. I've got characters here that go back to 2015. Every voice I've done in a book is right here. So that when the guy, because sometimes you do a book and you don't know that it's a series. They may write another book. And you may find out that, you know, your character's coming back. But I, I write every character in the thing. I do voice, get a feel. So, okay, here he is. So that way I know that president so-and-so is different than secretary of state so-and-so. So that's why you got to keep track of the voices because your listener will. And it changes, the, it changes the whole context and the whole understanding of it if you don't maintain your vocal selections. And a character is not a voice. A character is a character. Find the character first, then the voice happens, okay? Don't mm -hmm. plug the voice in because you can do a great uh, Woody Woodpecker sound. That's not going to work. Uh, let me ask you a question. So I know an audiobook narrator who he's fairly successful. When he records a book, he, he like you, he reads through the book once. He, he bookmarks the different uh, characters. But then he records all of the each character throughout the entire book at once. So if one character is on page 13 and then again on page 322, he'll record just those clips of that one character. And later on, he goes back and edits everything together. It causes him extra time editing, but he says it results in a very consistent sounding character. What are your thoughts on that? Can you tell? <laughs> I think- Well, ludicrous. I don't think you can. I mean, if a character I, is separated by 300 pages, I don't think the listener will ever remember if it's slightly, uh, you know- Yes, that's a, a, that's one point. And generally, here, the protagonist in a fiction book is gonna be whatever you sound like, because you're, that's who you, especially first person, it's gonna, the, the, the person is gonna be, if it's, if it's an I, 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 first person, it's gonna be Johnny Heller because I'm doing the book. Now I may make it a little different for if it's noir versus um, a little kid with a donut shop, you know, whatever, depends what's going on. But I, I think you gotta play the context of the scene. So if your character goes up on page 13 and everything's kind of just nothing, it's an office scene, nothing's happening. And later page 300, He's in a knife fight with Hell's Angels with only Mother Teresa as his backup. He's going to be a different character sound. It, yeah. it has to change. The character changes in the context of the scene. So I don't know if you can do the guy like this and then later, good. I, I don't, I, it seems odd also because I'm anti anything technical like editing that crap together and slap. I, I, no, I, I would, my, my advice is no. My, my technique is no. And my suggestion is no. Don't do that. I don't care how successful he is. It sounds, um, it sounds anti, um, it, it just, no, no, I wouldn't do that. Not, not, I don't know. This is the first I've ever heard of anyone even doing that. It sounds yeah, he's the only one I know also. Yeah. I yeah just so that, it was, that tells you something, it, one out of a gazillion. So yeah. yeah. I, I just want to emphasize a few things that Johnny said. A character is a character and not a voice. I think that that's really profound and important for everybody uh, whatever genre you're working in, uh, in voiceover. And I also just want to um, uh, echo Johnny talking about kind of casting your characters from the bank of the world that you know. Uh, uh, so, you know, it sort of reminds me of when James Andrews was here and he was talking about even working on commercials and speaking to someone that you know about this commercial or about this product and why it's exciting for them. Uh, to bring you that level of intimacy and, and personal space. And I think I love like Johnny's concept of how he would cast these characters based on something he's familiar with. So he has, so, so that helps him ground these characters as people and not as archetypes or stereotypes or something more shallow, right? I mean, this is like a creative process that we want to give nuance and, and, and care into. So Johnny, thank you 
so much. That's really, um, yeah, that's really wonderful. So, okay, as we're just getting through more people, um, from Elizabeth, Johnny, if you're doing a demo clip for audiobooks or um, documentary, what kind of music bed should you use? Oh, I'm guessing it wouldn't be as high energy as what you'd use for commercials or animation. So, yeah, Johnny, yeah. do you want to just yeah. quickly address that? None. Okay, next. Yep. Uh, David, you can talk about audiobook demos uh, if you want right now. Yeah, well, no, let me just play off of what Johnny said. Yeah, I mean, audiobooks typically don't have music, but Johnny, there are a couple of occasions. Some children's books do. Sometimes there might be a little music sting at the very beginning at an introduction, but it's that's really very rare. That used to be more common. Um, no, not not in person, a demo. Not in a demo. And to the person who asked the question about, uh, she said something very interesting, and I, I want to comment. She said uh, the music wouldn't be as... Um, as energetic as it would be in commercial music and animation. I'm not sure why you say that because some commercials are energetic, but others are not. And the ones which are not don't there, therefore generally don't have energetic music. Same with animation. Uh, the, the music is there to tell the listener how to feel. That's the purpose of music in any, in, in any voiceover uh, application, right? It, it's a, it further enhances the emotion that, that the uh, client wants to convey. And so if it's, a, if it's a commercial about a serious subject matter, the music is not necessarily energetic. So I just think, I, I'm trying to get to the point here. I think the point is never, never have a default, never think that there's a default style for any genre in our industry. In other words, commercials are not necessarily energetic and likewise narrations are not, natural, uh, not uh, always sort of low key, right? There are upbeat uh, and energetic narrations and there are low key commercials. So just a, a Point of reference. I want to um, combine Jeffrey's question with um, uh, with Stacy's question. So folks are talking about, you know, they're we've got theater people in the house. Uh, I'm one of you. So and so is Johnny. Yeah, hell yeah. Okay, so um, people are asking about, you know, when you uh, are kind of desirous and actually capable of working in multiple genres in voiceover. Um, you know, what do you do if you feel like you're being asked to chop off your arm for the sake of your leg? Um, can you coincide audio audiobooks and commercial VO? You know, I know, Johnny, you do commercials and um, audiobooks, but you mostly do audiobooks. Am I right? Like you like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's become that's become my uh, my world, I guess. Yeah. I might have okay. set out that way. It just worked out. And is that because you kind of just, you just don't have time to do it all, <laughs> really? Well, I, I know it's a factor of time. I think that, um, you know, I found reasonable, here's, I wanted to be an actor all my life. And I spent uh, um, 25, 30 years to become the overnight success that I am. So um, it's a, it's a um, I tended bar forever. Um, when I found success, in voiceover, hey, I didn't even know, I didn't know much about voice. I didn't think I'd be voiceover. I thought I'd be the second banana in a sitcom. That's what I thought. Um, just too short to be the head guy uh, and not tall enough to be the bad guy. So I decided that uh, a voiceover just worked in audiobooks. I love because it's the single most organic acting experience I've had outside of uh, being on stage. And for me, it, it, it just checks all the boxes. So, but you, but it doesn't mean, but the thing is, whatever voiceover area you're involved in, it's still, it's, it's home in acting. It's acting first, everything else second, everything else second. So when I do commercials now, I get called, the reason I was successful in commercials isn't because I was such a great actor, it's because I have a quirky voice. That the people either like or, you know, they wanted, uh, they thought I was new and different. And I really got to the point where they wanted Johnny Heller types, not Johnny Heller. And when that happened, I decided to start doing audiobooks because they still wanted me there. I'm still a, I'm still Johnny Heller, and they still look for Johnny Heller types. They don't want they don't want the original. So I don't know what that is. So I still audition regularly for commercials. I think right now the the competition for any voiceover gig, any voiceover gig is astronomical. A because there are home studios. Um, there are all these pay to play sites, there's all these things. You guys have got to understand that if you don't get the gig or a bunch of gigs, it has nothing to do generally, unless you suck, with your ability. 
You know, if you shot that, you know, there you go. But if you don't, and assuming you're all swell, a lot of it's just numbers. If David says, I'm gonna to listen to 50 people and the commercial is mm-mm, I'll bet you anything he doesn't listen to 50 mm-mms. Number 12, by number 12, he's gonna pick the mm-mm he wants. And if you're number 15, that's just the bad luck. So a lot of that, so there's, a, there's the, the element of luck, assuming talent, okay? Assuming talent, then the element of luck is gigantic. In audiobooks, luck has less to do with it because you've gotta be talented. And, and they can pick that. Now, again, one thing I want to touch on real quick, Jeffrey uh, uh, asked a question I saw in the chat about slating in auditions and demos. And the answer basically, people don't slate much anymore at all. It's on the MP3. Certainly in an audiobook demo, you don't slate. There's no need to slate your name because it's going to be on your website. They know who it is because there's you. It'll say Jeffrey Lyle Siegel. So they know who it is. They don't need to hear your name five times and they'll get irritated. They want to hear... They want to hear you do the gig right away. They don't want to spend any time hearing your name, which is because they're so busy. But yeah, they don't. So you don't have to do that, Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I auditioned for Google with the, the Hey Google, and that was my audition. And that, you know, uh, it feels a pretty humbling to be like, how are th <laughs> these are two words? And I don't, I hope they like my two words. I uh, <laughs> job in case anyone was curious about that. Um, <laughs> you walk out going, oh, I really screwed that up. <laughs> Hey Google. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Oh, I said hi Google. No. <laughs> um. So I we have so many. Oh, everyone, I want you to know that yes, this is being recorded. It will be on YouTube. I will post it tomorrow, so you'll get all of this um information. Uh, and uh, so so slating is good. People, oh, there's a lot of questions about handling tables of contents, glossaries, footnotes, indexes. Do you want to? Um, Unless the publisher requests it, almost never. Sometimes you'll do acknowledgments. Sometimes you'll do a forward. The forward you'll probably do acknowledgments. Sometimes never the table of contents. Almost never footnotes unless they're germane to the uh, information. Generally nonfiction, unless it's important. Um, so rarely a footnotes. Um, never a table of contents and index. No, not that either. Unless you unless you requested to. And then it, it's boring for you, but it's extra loot. Awesome. Um, Johnny, do you need a separate website for voiceover or uh, for commercial or um, audiobook work? Not necessarily a separate website, but certainly a separate link. This is super important. When you send your notice to David Goldberg books that I want to do audiobooks to David Goldberg books, first know what kind of books David Goldberg is publishing. Let's say he just does erotica. We don't send him your Christian or vice versa. Know what kind of books he's publishing. Seriously. I've seen people send unquestionably wrong things and they're not going to get the job. The other thing is David's going to go to look at Johnny's site. And I said, David, I'm going to work for him. He's okay. Let me go to the link. He goes to the link and there's a paragraph or three about my high school extracurricular activities and how important they were to me. And then a few bits about my family. And then he still didn't get anything. David needs to go to the link that shows my work. And if David's hiring me for commercial, the link I sent him goes right to my commercial demo. If I want audiobooks, the link he goes to will be right to my audiobooks. In other words, your link has, what you send has got a link to the job you want. You don't need a separate website, but you need a different tab, a different drawdown, and that's what you send him to. And if he wants to go back and read about you know, my high school play, great. But he wants to hear my work in the genre he's interested in. Don't waste, the, be the answer to the problem the client may have, not another problem. I, I wanna get one more question in that I think is important because lots of folks are asking. Um, uh, given your you know, love of all things tech, do you outsource your editing to engineers or do you I, do it? I don't, even, I don't know how to edit, I don't have a clue. Yes, I, outsource, I usually work for publishers and they do it if I didn't, you know, here's James Romick waving. There are James Romick, there's James Romick, and no, no offense to James Romick, there are James Romickses out there who are editors, who do it for a living. There are proofers and preppers. I outsource, the, listen, if you can outsource, you think it's an expense, it isn't. You make more money if you have more time to act. Spend the money to outsource so that everybody else does the crap you don't wanna do and you can just act. I don't know how to edit, I don't know how to master. I don't, and I can't, you can't proof yourself. 
if I say something wrong, it's because I clearly don't know how to say it. I'm not going to fix it because I th look, it's integral or integral. And if you don't know which one, you need somebody to prove that. And, and further to that, so let me add on one thing. So in our casting department, thousands of times, I've seen clients listen to auditions who will say a, a particular voice actor is great, but the recording sounds horrible. And so we won't hire them. And I'll listen to that audition and I'll say, you know what, it's just, it's just because of there was a lack of editing or, or poor editing, or there's some noise in the background, which we could filter out, but the clients don't know that. The clients don't know what's possible. It's not their, their place to know what's possible. They shouldn't have to ask uh, for anything special. So if you can't edit, or if you don't want to edit, or if you're not sure if your sound is good, yeah, call, you know, uh, reach out to someone like James or, you know, someone who can help you because yeah, like you said, Johnny, it's, uh, it's, it's critical to your success and it's an investment. You know, it, your, your stuff has to sound good. And further to that point even, so the client is listening to your audition and someone else's, and if their audition just has a better sound quality, putting the, the performance aside, if the sound quality is better on someone else's audition, then they're more likely to get that job. So yeah, make sure that you either edit and process cleanly or have someone do it for you. Uh, you know, just echoing Tom Deere once again, uh, your time is more important than your money. It's a confusing thing, but to Johnny's point, he has more time to act and book more books because he's not editing his voice, which also he doesn't like to do. James <laughs> and Micah are up in here being like, I love editing. It's, whoa, that sounds like wacky, but okay, you know what? If you love to do that and get paid for that, Johnny can get paid to act and you know, these are, um, these, we're in his house. Yeah, these are really good. Great, we're dropping links. Um, awesome. So my friends, we are here at, we're getting close to the end. Um, I appreciate you all so much. If you um, want to drop your socials in the, in the chat so people can follow each other. If you want to give some love to Johnny, who has given us this hour donated time just to, just as a beautiful human being that he is, um, yeah, it, he is informative and funny. It's true. Uh, it's a real treat to get to spend this, this time with him. Um, and if you want more time with Johnny, you have a sweet, sweet coupon right here, $25 off of coaching for, and use the code, ask me anything. And you can book a session with him through us. If you want to work with David, uh, that, um, that code does work at David's link right here. Uh, I am teaching social media for voice actors on may 12th so if you want to hang out with me we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about clubhouse we're gonna talk about twitter we're gonna talk about you know all my good examples of how voice actors uh do well on social media um and i won't get negative but i'll help you succeed in a positive way we also of course i'll drop this link once again to our mixer that's again more time with me if you like the way i run things <laughs> get a lot of me going on uh, here at edge coming up and then finally if you're new 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 and you're like i just don't know what to do siobhan we got you here's a code for your investigate voiceover class uh so you can sign up with us and just get an evaluation have a conversation uh, in a different format for three hours with a professional voice actor. Um, yes, yes, every, drinks are way overdue, Mr. Heller. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> who wrote that? <laughs> that was Brian uh, Conover. Conover, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we do have a Heller's Angels, uh, you know, joke that's going on. You in see, my house. shirt says, "Look, bourbon and books." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I mean, really, that is the that's the ultimate uh, evening, I would say. Johnny, thank you for being with us. Any closing remarks for our aspiring uh, audiobook folk? Um, you know, yeah, real quick, because I don't want to close enough. First, you did a great job, Siobhan. You ran this beautifully. It was very impressive. Seriously, Ern, it was great. Um, uh, second thing is, there's a lot of questions, and it's great to ask the questions. But don't fear this opportunity. Don't, you know, don't, don't be afraid to put your foot in the water or just jump right in. I will say that you've, you've got to, uh, um, you've got to believe in yourself. And the only things you can't do, literally you can't do as an actor is what you tell yourself you can't. Most of the time, you know the answer. And most of the time you can do it. Um, simple as that. That being said, don't, don't lie about, 
being able to, you know, do like a Czechoslovakia and a Hitman and not not being able to play him like Pepe Le Pew. Don't do that. If you can't do that, don't don't take that gig. Uh, yes, it definitely the the fear the, the fear in the head is is the ultimate roadblock, uh, and especially with something as I will say as difficult as audiobooks. It's not you know people like I love reading like great that doesn't mean audiobooks are easy. Um, David, any last words from you? I always have awesome. the same words. I thank everyone for joining us. Um, your time shows that you care about the industry, about learning. And one of the things Johnny stressed earlier in this class was learning should never end. And that's exactly uh, what you're giving of your own time right now. So I think that is fantastic. And uh, Siobhan, yeah, as Johnny said, you rock. Uh, you always do just such a terrific job. Doesn't you, everyone, isn't you yes. great at, at hosting these? The energy is terrific. Johnny, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great always seeing, always great seeing you. Um, yeah, hopefully soon in person, my friend. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Books and bourbon in the summer, maybe. <laughs> but uh, yes, until then, everyone, thank you. I'm just reflecting the light that you shine on to me. And being in the presence of Johnny always brings me joy. And of course, getting to know David so well throughout this year of doing these AMAs with you all, seeing your faces. Mercedes, it's great to see you again. Dawn, it's always so good to see you. Um, I really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll be back on the 29th. Actually, that's a big day. We'll be like doing this, we'll be do, and then we'll do the mixer in the evening. So, you know, if you're like just really into, you know, hanging out with me and David, uh, David will be at the mixer as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Sweet dreams to Daniel and everyone abroad. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're in bed soon. Dubai, I don't know what time it is over there, uh, but hey, we really appreciate all of you and the almost 150 folks we had throughout our session today. Johnny, once again, thanks for these beautiful gems of, of knowledge and thought and care into this industry, which really requires a lot of love. And so uh, woo, now I'm all full of feelings and now I'm going to go deal with them. Uh, I, <laughs> it's great to be in your presence. And have a wonderful day, everybody. I'll um, make sure to be following you all on socials and see you soon. You can Bye. follow me on socials. Okay. Bye. I'm on follow socials. Johnny. I'll tag him. You know the deal. Mwah. Bye, everyone. Bye, all. Bye. Bye.